1956 Norfolk. Let's go back when you were a little kid. What was life like when you were just a little kid? The only thing I can remember, or my earliest memory, is uh, walking along Norfolk Beach, probably in the autumn with my parents, I think being held probably by my father, and I remember the lights on the boardwalk. Um, there's a beautiful boardwalk, very old-fashioned. People who've gone to Coney Island, you know, until maybe recently you know what a boardwalk like that is and uh, somehow those lights and that cool evening impressed me as a two or three year old. Do you remember your grandparents at all? Yes, very well. My, I was very close to my grandmother. My grandmother um, had a huge impact in my life. A woman um, who grew up in uh, poverty on the Lower East Side around Orchard Street is father committed suicide at the age when she was maybe four. Um, uh, he was in a terrible accident. Uh, her, f her father, um, after her father's death, her mother remarried. I remember her mother from when I was very little. She came to visit us once in Norfolk. And she was a sweet Yiddish Bobby. What about your grandparents on the other side? Uh, no, I never knew them. My father's father died around the year I was born, and his mother died when he was 13. Do you remember what your grandparents did for a living? Uh, my, my grandfather on my, on my father's side was a wood turner. He learned wood turning uh, from his father. Uh, I actually have a diploma of his that he acquired in the city of Lvov in the eight, 1890s, I guess. Uh, he later turn, went from wood turning into pipe making, and my family was connected with pipe making well into the 50s. Although my father's father, my, gran his, my grandfather on his side, was more, I think his primary contract was to do umbrella handles. And uh, he had a hearing problem, so I understand. But somehow he got along yeah. in life. Did you ever hear stories about how they came to this country? Yes, they, on my father's side, they came a little later, on my mother's side. They came in 1907, and we were able to find the ship that they came over on. Uh, I believe it was a Royal Hamburg line. It is posted at the uh, Ellis Island website. Um, and most of the children are listed there, but a very traditional, proper, immigrant-looking Jewish family, um, urbanized because they had the, the, their children had been raised in the city of Lvov, which was a, quite a significant city in the western Ukraine, then in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Did you ever hear stories of why they decided to come here? No, my father didn't know. I've asked him about the, the decision making. I was able to rescue family documents when my great uncle died. Mm -hmm. uh, the lawyer had a pile of things that he said were going to be trashed and I asked him to just forward, not to throw out anything, just to send me all the trash uh, that was left over from his apartment. And in there I was able to find all the immigration documents uh, which showed exactly the time when they were thinking about immigrating as well as a birth certificate showing the date and place my father's grandfather was born. Mm -hmm. His name was Moses Heller, and he, he was born in a tiny town in uh, the area of Slovakia, just near the Hungarian border. There are a lot of Jews um, uh, who live there, mainly Hasidic, and those with the name Heller generally believe themselves to be descendants of Yom Tov Lipman Heller. Um, in my case, the family was highly assimilated, and so legends and descent like that really wasn't part of the family memory, um, but it's a possibility. Tell me about how your uh, mom's grandparents now came to this country. My mom is descended uh, from a family known as Sue Wayne. Uh, they, the, uh, the Suwain is a combination of two families, the Alfens and the Suwains, who married around 1789. Uh, they were from Metz and Strasbourg suburbs, respectively, so Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, they came uh, to the city of Nantes in 
just before Nantes opened up to Jews uh, in the revolutionary year, 1789. And Nantes is a very complicated situation for two reasons. One is because most of the economic opportunities in the city uh, involved slave trading. Mm -hmm. um, the shipping uh, for the slave trade was primarily out of, in France, was primarily out of the city of Nantes. Uh, secondly, because Nantes was the sea, it was the capital of mass murder in the, uh, in, during the French Revolution. This is where the you know, mass murder of Catholics and traditional Catholics and priests in the countryside around there. It was a place which was highly ideologized and um, that was the area in which they made their home and they became among the founders of Nantes and even after the revolution and after Napoleon they were still listed as community leaders, mm -hmm. the Jewish community there. The uh, Suwains are definitely Alsatian. Uh, um, or at least there's no reason to believe there's anything more there than that. On the Alphen side, the uh, speculation that I've adopted based on the best evidence is that it's derived from the name Chalfon. And just recently, that controversy was laid aside, and we now know Chalfon is in fact uh, the origin of this Alphen. Uh, and th we've been able to push the genealogy back as of the last two weeks to 1545 to a, a Mordecai Chalfen of the city of Prague who came from Prague I think in 1567. He was one of the founding families of the city of Metz, the founding Jewish families. Tell me about your parents. I had extraordinary good fortune uh, to be born to two extremely charming, good-hearted people. Um, my Both of them were born in circumstances that by contemporary light wouldn't be the best. They were born into poor uh, immigrant families and they in the course of their life, they just saw one new horizon after the other. It was a, a life of constant discovery, expansion of taste, and opportunity, which for them gave them a sense of infinite possibility and, and, and uh, enormous gratitude. And I was born into a family that was filled with that gratitude. Did they ever tell you how they met? Yes, they did. My, my father was in the Navy at that time in Norfolk, Virginia. My mother's family had moved to Norfolk, Virginia uh, from Brooklyn uh, around the time of World War II. And she spent the war years uh, there. She was on her way to a dance. She taught dance then, a very young woman. And she was introduced to him while he was eating pie in some cafeteria and she started eating his pie and then I think his liver and it never stopped. <laughs> What's the one family memory when you were a little kid that's your favorite one? I have a memory of situations that repeated themselves that um, when we were young my family enjoyed playing games and that was uh, uh, and then sometimes uh, they would read to me. Um, at that time I was a big reader, but I just loved the experience of being read to. But games with the entire family, we played games like Yahtzee, uh, we played a game called Stock Market, um, we played Monopoly, and those kinds of family games, which I, you know, nowadays it really is hard to, have to summon up all the patience to, right. to do that with their children. They, frequently did that with us or take us to the beach when we lived in Florida we would spend whole Sundays just being there on the beach and you know once you get in the feel of you know the surf pounding you and you do that all day it's something that never leaves you. Now was your dad in one of the wars? My dad was in between uh, he was in the Navy in between the World War II and Korea okay. Okay. and he, he was in the service for the very beginning of the Korean War, but he was in a different, he was stationed in Norfolk at that time. Now, your brother older or younger than you? Younger. So when he came along, how was that for you? Huh. You'd have to ask Rick how, <laughs> how it was. I remember really loving my brother. And uh, so there's none of that sibling uh, sibling rivalry. There's intense sibling rivalry. <laughs> intense. Um, Rick and I are extremely close and very loving brothers, and yeah. that's and 
That is the truth. Now, where did you go to high school? I started off at a school called Jesuit in Tampa, Florida, and then went to another school called Plant High School, and then um, left after my junior year for college. Now, did your family move to Tampa? Yes, they moved from Norfolk to Tampa in 1962. What do you remember from high school? I was involved um, in a local temple. Uh, the good memories of high school had to do with a youth group uh, I was involved in, and I had a, a very close friend, still a close friend, and who lived in the Miami area. His name is Rabbi Stephen Lebo, and Steve and I um, had a very good friendship, which we've maintained for decades, and but we didn't see each other except through camp activity camp and youth group related activities um, those are some of the best memories um, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of confusion those years and I was very caught up in reading now when you were you know a young man a mm -hmm. teenager and whatnot you know very turbulent time in this country you know, the hippie movement of course the Vietnam era mm -hmm. how did all that affect you as a young kid well my mother was interested in every everything, and so she would take us uh, to political rallies. So, for example, we went to a Nixon rally in 19 when he was running in 1968, and I remember they sat us in the Voices for Nixon part of the audience in a huge uh, auditorium in Tampa. I believe it was Tampa, and uh, I just remember the excitement. I found it all pretty confusing. I was 11 or 12 right, at the right. time and uh, um, otherwise unmemorable. The most memorable part of it were the uh, protesters outside. There were a group of people with, I mean, terribly dressed uh, in torn jeans, torn shirts, mostly barefoot who were carrying protest signs in a circle walking around the front. And that. Um, I think that was the beginning of my awareness that that wasn't just something in a magazine. It was part of a world I was coming into. Now, you finished high school in three years? Um, uh, in the, I, I finished in the 11th grade. Okay. And then it was on the college. Where did you go to school? I uh, was uh, given admission to University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. I wanted to study um, historical linguistics with a man named Albert Guessman, um, long deceased now. And Guessman was um, from Prague and great linguist, and uh, he sort of introduced me into the classics, classical languages, and classical studies. And then later, um, later I became interested in Hebrew, and he was one of my. Um, instructors in Hebrew and Semitic languages. So what, did, what were you planning on getting into then when you were in college? I was um, a person who was drawn more to uh, European style classical education and it didn't exist in any of the worlds that I knew. There were a few places in America where you could get it but I it wasn't on my radar screen. I cobbled it together uh, mainly out of emigre professors and uh, my interest was in having a broad background. My religious taste, I was extremely disappointed um, in Judaism, um, Jewish institutions that I had grown up in and I was uh, what you would call an extremely interested but disaffected Jew and I used uh, I used education as a substitute for mm -hmm. Jewish involvement. So what was it that steered you into law? It was, it was something that I could do. Uh, it, business was very, general business was very distasteful. I was looking for something that required um, writing and thinking skills uh, and that would eventually allow me to have the independence to be an independent researcher right. when I grew up, and, and that's what it's allowed. Okay, where did you go to law school? 
here in town. We're uh, at Southern Methodist University. Okay. So your whole family moved to Dallas at some point? They moved in 1974, I believe. First they went from Tampa to Atlanta, where my father was district manager, and then from Atlanta to Dallas around 74. Who was he working for at the time? Learner Shops. Okay. Um, he, had, he was a senior executive and he had risen all the way through the ranks. Uh, and Dallas was their home. I had, my, we had moved around a lot as a, a young person. I had gone to many schools, had a lot of different experiences. Wasn't believed that a stable life might be somewhat better. Um, <laughs> for me and for my children right, right. one day, and that's why I stayed here. Where, where did you meet Karen? Karen? I was introduced to Karen at a um, after a Shabbat evening at a party at a uh, South African friend's home. And uh, she was there, and I had never had an experience like that before. Unfortunately, she was engaged. Okay, so there's more to this story. This, the story is that she would, I went home, I told my law school roommate that I met the woman I want to marry. Unfortunately, she was engaged. And uh, he, he told me, read your niggist. That's uh, Amharic for queen. We'll, we'll come to you soon. <laughs> and so in, six months later, she came back to Dallas. And uh, uh, through my mother, I learned that she had returned and she was no longer engaged and I immediately started doing what I needed to do. Yeah. <laughs> when did you guys get married? 1982. It took her, it took her a long time to agree. <laughs> um, talk to me about Jewish life here for you guys, your involvement within the community. Um, I, my interest in, in Jewish life was in creating an um, area of life where people were able to study and conduct independent research on areas of interest and support one another without um, without a feeling being uh, appearing pretentious or embarrassing. I, I cannot tell you how stifling the atmosphere was uh, when I came in the 70s. I used uh, I taught at Sherith and for a while at Temple Shalom and at Beth Torah, uh, late 70s and the 80s, um, just as a way to keep, uh, mainly in, in history courses, I created a curriculum for uh, medieval study, Jewish studies at, at Sherith. And, uh, but I kept finding that the kids weren't interested in, and I became aware the problem was their parents. Um, the parents really viewed this as a luxury and a matter of indifference to their lives. The rabbis had, begun, had simply repeated the lectures they heard in rabbinic school uh, for the most part. The people were really not in a, interested in independent work. And there was a lot of unthoughtfulness about big issues in, uh, on the question of uh, liberal Judaism and the relationship between uh, liberal Judaism and the Jewish past. And my background was in classical philosophy as well as in history. And I eventually decided uh, that to overcome the atmosphere would be important uh, to establish something like a set of seminars, Jewish, the equivalent of Jewish great books. I began uh, editing hundreds of books over the course of 20 years uh, and conducted seminars all over town. Many uh, of them continued for decades. To, there's even one that's still in existence that I you know, don't participate in regularly, but I, I talk to the, the folks about. In your lifetime, there's been so many advancements in technology and like very rapidly. Um, is there something that came along that you go, wow, how did we ever get along without that? Yeah, it, it was something that I wanted desperately. It was the digitization of books. Yeah. The ability to, to search libraries of books was something I followed very closely all through the, the coming of the digital age. And it let, I, I was so anxious for it that uh, when I was 
uh, very involved with the Jewish Historical Society in the mid 90s. We're talking 94 to 95. Uh, I also utilized uh, the first days of the web with a friend of mine, David Boltz, to create something called the Dow's Virtual Jewish Community. And DVJC still exists, and I still have the, the URL. I've, I've taken it down because developments in technology um, really require a complete rethinking of how it's used. But my goal was to upload uh, to that site all kinds of material relating to Jewish life, which I did, including the poetry of Rachel Landris, whose fam family generously provided the funding uh, to do that. Now, I know you've done a lot with genealogy with your own family. Have you made some amazing discoveries along the way? They're amazing from a family point of view. Sure. Many people uh, in my family believe that Moses Heller was born in Lemberg until I found the documents from my great uncle and we discovered, in fact, he was Slovakian. And that has that has implications, uh, probably for genealogy, for the possibility of other close relatives. Also, for the, it exemplifies a pattern that went on in Europe in the late 19th century during the modernization era. You know, there's this view that everybody lived in shtetls. Um, and that they came directly to America. And that really wasn't the pattern. The pattern was the movement to a large city and then a feeling that this large city's opportunities have been exhausted mm. and that the real opportunities lay in large cities in America. And this is true for the people that immigrated after 1880. Yeah. Now, before that, there was, especially among Alsatians, there was a tendency to become backwoods and southern peddlers. But after 1880, the the transition was usually from uh, rural to local city in Eastern Europe, and then from that big city to America, and that was my family's pattern. Now, in your lifetime, you've lived through so many momentous occasions. Of course, you saw, you know, as a young kid, you saw, you know, some protesting going on in this country. Of course, also when you were young, the president uh, assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, the Martin Luther King assassination, something good, the moon landing in 69, of course the tragedy of 9-11. Was there something in your lifetime that happened on the national scene that you go, you know, it really affected you, you know exactly where you were when it happened? Well, sure. Um, the, the same way in my parents' generation where everybody remembered the day FDR died. Right. Um, I remember very clearly what was going on when JFK was shot. I was walking with my brother away from the school and we heard it announced over the intercom the president has been shot and then the next memory I have is my mother in front of a black and white TV set in tears while watching a funeral yeah yeah, yeah. Um, on but Martin, Martin Luther King was a lot more complicated I rem the things that I remember was the strange man who shot him it was just that was such an inconceivable thing it, you know, the, the Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby don't leave as strong an impression on me as um, James Earl Ray. Right. Um, he really seemed to embody something about America that concerned me a lot and uh, no longer seemed ex exceptional, something, something that I, I had my eye on probably from then the rest of my life. Happiest time in your life? So there are different kinds of happiness. The happiness that I had uh, with uh, camaraderie and study um, combined was my summer with my friend Rabbi Lebo, uh, studying with uh, Professor Eugen Kuhlmann at Kenyon College. He, wa he became one of uh, the, the great teachers of my life probably the greatest that I'll ever have and um, there are very few, he was a very rare penetrating mind a thorough thoroughly individual mm -hmm. um, man completely steeped in classical and Jewish learning completely and yet had a very natural ironic way of speaking and extremely generous and kind to me marriage was overhyped in terms of the wedding day but the happiest I, I think I was was when Karen agreed uh, to be engaged to me that that was a I really felt that I had achieved something 
amazing. Now you and Karen have two grown daughters. Yes. And one grandchild on the way. Correct. What advice does granddad want to leave to the next generation? I wrote, I wrote uh, something to my to my f- oldest daughter the day that she was born, and I read it part an excerpt from it at the wedding. But at that time, I, I can't say that I've I can't say my advice has really changed. Um, I recommended that. We don't really know what the future will hold. We don't know who we will be or how we will be. But chassidut or kindness will make things much easier. And I've never found a better word of advice to give to anyone, no matter how difficult the situation. Great job today, man. You did really well. 